Well, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming to uh, this symposium. Uh, my name is Ian Schoons. Uh, I work here at IDS, but I'm the co-director of the STEP Centre, which is hosting this event together with Andy Serling. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the STEP Centre is a collaboration between IDS and SPRU, both at the University of Sussex, um, which has been going since 2006, rather remarkably. Uh, supported by the ESRC, amongst others. Um, and one of the things that we've been thinking about over those years is indeed uncertainty and its implications. And we thought now was the time to try and deepen that conversation, deepen that debate, and spread it with a wider group of people to try and think about what seems to be a critical debate in so many domains uh, now. Because it seems to be a crucial moment right now to think about the politics and institutions of control, typ typified in many ways by, by risk management paradigm, which are being challenged on so many fronts because of uh, thinking about uncertainty. So I think uh, whether we're talking about uh, finance systems, or disease outbreaks, or disasters, or driverless cars, or electricity systems, or counter-terrorism, -terror earthquakes, or volcanoes, all themes that are going to be talked about in the next couple of days, uh, we're going to have some debates that cut across. Um, having looked through the abstracts, both for the themes and, uh, and for particular individual papers, I think we're in for a treat. Um, there are lots of discussions about radical, deep, everyday, ordinary uncertainties, um, and uncertainties both as a challenge to people, but also as a source of hope and opportunity. Now, as you probably have seen from the multiple emails that you've received, it's a slightly unusually organized event, which is on purpose, not just to confuse you, but to encourage what we hope will be a fruitful interchange between a lot of different people coming from different perspectives. We aim to have a, a, an event of, of 100 people at the most, and I think we've got just about that. There have been lots of requests of, have you got a space? No, we haven't, I'm sorry. Um, and we've had a process of invitation that has been devolved through uh, the 12 theme leads who have assembled a fantastic group of people. And just looking around, I mean, I know some of you, but actually I don't know most of you, I think, which I think is also a really positive aspect of an event because we tend often just to go to conferences and talk to people we already know. So the aim of this is to, you know, to some extent confront us and, and get us out of our comfort zones, to think across disciplines, across sectors, across experiences, diverse as the ones that I've just mentioned to challenge, to question, to learn, but do it, please, in an open but also respectful and constructive way. Because through this process, we really do hope to come out with some things that we've produced together, some outputs and thinking that actually can carry us forward. Um, because I think everyone in this room is committed to thinking about these debates, but we don't quite know where it may lead us. So hopefully by Friday, um, we will have a sense of where, where that's got to. Now, there are, as you know, four clusters uh, which have different uh, uh, themes associated with them, and people will stay with those clusters throughout the process, but we'll have a number of plenaries both to share insights from those clusters, but also plenary uh, presentations along the way. Um, Come Friday, we will be having these feedback sessions from the clusters uh, to try and think about whether we've got some new directions, both for thinking and practice emerging. Now, the clusters are all uh, cleverly color-coded. Um, they are associated with the different rooms, which start straight away tomorrow morning. So you need to know which cluster you're in, which room you're in. Uh, we've got lots of very helpful helpers around, PhD students and other others, um, 
who will give you color-coded directions tomorrow morning to the place that you need to be. So hopefully you won't get lost, which is very possible in this, this building. Um, so we hope that it will be a productive, exciting, stimulating, sometimes frustrating, but ultimately fruitful uh, couple of days. And we really, um, we really hope that uh, you enjoy it. Um, uh, and, and, and can contribute in, in, in the ways that I've discussed. So before I quickly hand, hand over to Andy, who's chairing the opening panel, um, just the statutory uh, issues about toilets and fire uh, hazards. So if there is a fire, there will be a fire alarm. You should leave either through that. Look for the green... Uh, green fire exits from this room, it's out of that, that door or out of that door, assemble outside. Both men's and women's toilets are just on the corridor, just uh, outside as you came into here. But other than that, that's all. On that note. On that note. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's cue for Andy. Uh, well, as I think yeah, I've got a microphone. You need, no, you, you've got a microphone. Yeah. So, uh, hello everybody, and my welcome to Ian. Thank you so much for joining us in this little Sussex adventure. We are really aware how idiosyncratic what we're attempting to do here, both in the breadth and the diversity and in the formatting, as Ian's just outlined. And so we're really grateful to everyone here for, for, for um, being intrigued and, and dealing with that, because it's a little bit unusual to ask people that the room is full of people who would routinely be given uh, opening plenaries to discussions around these themes. And we're really grateful to people for, for accepting this uh, structure of short talks. And no one more so than the plenary panel I have the privilege of chairing now, who, all of whose work in various ways has been really formative for me and for, I think for the work of the Step Centre over its uh, life so far, around these crucial issues of the relationship between uncertainty on the one hand, politics on the other, how do they relate, how does politics, in our view, sometimes get sidelined, but we want to have that issue up for interrogation here uh, by you from the different sectors. So with a view to introducing our panel, uh, we, I'll start from this side, and then we'll turn to our panellists who will be um, just making 10-minute talks to set us up with provocations, both for now and for the whole conference. And we'll just run through two iterations of discussion following uh, this, these opening short talks. So it'll be slightly unusual, and I am very grateful, colleagues, for your, for your putting up with this, uh, this restrictive format. But I think it's a way of really setting the tone for the meeting, where we make uh, short interventions and engage as much as possible in discussion. So near to be here, Silvio Funtowitz, known to many of us, um, started up a lot of this stuff going back to work on uncertainty and quality, going back to the 70s and 80s. Dion of the European Commission at the Joint Research Centre in Eastborough, now professor at University of Bergen in, uh, uh, in Norway. Um, so uh, we <laughs> I didn't have to, I didn't rehearse the Norway bit, so that's what I went wrong. Um, so thank you, Silva. You will be first. Next speaking will be Deepak Girwali. Uh, former water minister in Nepal, engaged in all kinds of acute issues around these subjects in that mode, academician of the Nepal uh, Academy of Science and Technology, and um, among many other contributions, uh, engaging with these issues directly in his work on uncertainty at a Himalayan scale, which I think we'll hear more about. And then uh, centrally in the panel here, speaking last in our series of three, uh, Professor Sheila Jasanoff from the Kennedy School, Professor of Science and Technology Studies, at the Kennedy School at Harvard University, founder of many initiatives that have been really formative in this area, the Science and Democracy Network, uh, many programs of work in science and technology studies, among other things, the ideas of co-production of knowledge and social order together, and socio-technical imaginaries, which I think will do some load-bearing work also in our discussions today. So thank you to the panel, um, and uh, Silvio, if you would like to please kick us off. Is it working? Uh, well, thank you, Andy, and my colleagues in the panel. Uh, in this uh, short time, I want to share with you uh, my experience of 40 years more working with and in uncertainty. 
And uh, what I like to do is uh, to do it through a couple, two or three illustrations, like snapshots of that transition from the beginning when I started to work on uncertainty uh, in the 70s, 80s, uh, to uh, today. Now, uh, and a lot of this is uh, my, the work I did with, uh, I still do, with Jerry Rabbits, which unfortunately couldn't be here uh, with us. Now, uh, probably uh, the first illustration. Probably uh, many of you remember uh, uh, the Rio conference in 1992. It was the conference United Nations on, on the environment and uh, well, I was there with the, and in particular, I want to remind you of a chapter that was called the Agenda 21. And specifically, one of the articles in, uh, in Agenda 21 that was called Principle 5, that's known as the precautionary principle. Now, in the meetings we had where we had the discussions about drafting uh, the principles, let's say, everybody knew and we were talking that, well, that the whole thing was about politically, political legitimacy in a context of scientific uncertainty, okay? Uh, to unpack this uh, sentence uh, will need a lot of time. So, I don't have to, but substantially was about, as I say, I repeat, about what, how do you legitimate action in the face of scientific uncertainty, okay? Now, it's interesting that when you realize, when you read principle five, the text, that the word uncertainty is not mentioned. And, uh, I will read what it says. It says, lack of full scientific certainty. Now, a question for you to reflect is, and those who have experience in, in drafting this type of articles, you know that you don't put more words than necessary uh, because that has to do with agreements and, you know. But the fact is that the drafting group decided to use this long sentence of characterization saying lack of full scientific certainty instead of scientific uncertainty. So uh, immediately have uh, two questions which I won't answer, but question. The first is why? And the second is is scientific uncertainty the same as lack of full scientific certainty? These are very important questions that have to do with a particular moment on time and also with the subject of, uh, of this meeting, which is political, uh, uh, the political and strategic aspects of uncertainty. Then, Next snapshot is about 10 years later. And 10 years later, what you have is uh, people started to write about uh, the strategic role of uncertainty. And you had papers and books talking about the fabrication or the manufacturing of uncertainty. Uh, I think Andy and perhaps Brian, who is there at the back, remember uh, in particular David Make Michaels from the, when we did the, uh, the, the Euro European Environmental Agency book on late lessons. And they, Mike, David Michaels, an epidemiologist, uh, American, he writes a book which I wrote, uh, is, it was called uh, 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 doubt is their product, that there were several uh, uh, papers that he wrote about precisely the 
uh, uh, the strategic use of uncertainty. In particular, as you can imagine, it was related to uh, corporations and lobbies uh, that used uncertainty uh, to, to fight uh, regulation. Okay? Now, uh, the point I want to make and the, and the question is this. Uh, uh, when you say fabrication of manufacturing uncertainty, immediately you think about something negative. You know, you don't say manufacturing, or you know, fabricating. So, uh, at the same time, we know that science and technology are great producers of uncertainty. So the question is that I will put to you, how do we distinguish the good uncertainty from the bad uncertainty? The uncertainty that it is just part and parcel of uh, the scientific work and the uh, deployment of technology from that that it is used strategically or politically to uh, delay or stop regulation. And also, in my own experience, is uh, I remember first years we used to work, mainly in relation to nuclear power, on risk and the other thing, we were using strategically uncertainty. And then it's the corporation. So we can say that in these years, you could see how everybody learned how to use or play the uncertainty game. How am I doing on time? I have about 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, just uh, to uh, finish uh, and leave those questions open, I can say in my perspective that what I see is that in relation to uncertainty and with uh, is the trajectory of uncertainty in years I've been working on is quite similar to the trajectory of a, a, a word that it is related, which is complexity. So at the beginning, the purpose was to reject uncertainty and complexity. Perhaps as Andy mentioned, through tra transform or reduce all uncertainty into risk. Okay. Uh, later, what I saw is that uncertainty and complexity was uh, accepted, let me use the word, but it was judged as a mistake of nature. And thus, the role of science and technology is just to produce uh, fixes in order to correct that mistake. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So exactly what we were asking for. Thanks. Really uh, opening up a lot of key questions which we'll fold back in. And especially, I think, mentioning precaution, which uh, as we sit here now is under, I think, I don't know if you would agree, unprecedented threat institutionally around the world, not least in the European Union. So these are not just academic issues at the moment. So thank you very much for that. Moving on then to Deepak, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Actually, we gathered here to share our confusions because confusion is, in a sense, synonymous with uncertainty. You may like the word perplexity, and that's what I'm going to share with you. Uh, I'm going to take you from my experience in development all the way to currently my toying, up, toying with ideas of philosophy on this topic. But uh, I'm going to start with uh, the most certain of all subjects, astrology. Uh, recently, I had for a family ritual to see my family astrologer. And what struck me in, in, in a side conversation with him was how our politicians listen more to astrologers than they listen to a member of the Academy of Sciences like me. Okay? Now, this is quite uh, humiliating, if you think of it. But then, you know, we had, a, we had several prime ministers who won elections and would not take oath of office because the astrologer said the time was not right. 
So we had four days when you had elected prime minister and no government. Now, which leads me to say that astrology should probably be taught as political science. You know, If somebody wanted to attack Nepal, just figure it out and send the tanks in when you have not got uh, a prime minister. Now, what this leads me to argue about is how people decide and what they decide and what they believe and what they choose to believe in, you know, is so way off and wide from what we have been taught to believe as scientists. Okay. And this we meet every day in everyday politics. Okay. It's perplexing. Now, let me go to development, which is where I have been in. And uh, way back in the uh, mid-80s, there was a famous conference in New York, uh, upstate place called Mohonk. Uh, and uh, out of that came an interesting book called Unter Uncertainty on Himalayan Scale. Now, this was a look at, uh, you know, the, 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 the philosophy behind intervention in the Himalayas, which was that there was deforestation going on, and Himalayas were going to be bald in 10 years, and there would be flood in Bangladesh, and so on and so forth. The reality on the ground was quite different. Community electricity had started, community uh, forestry had started, and currently we have far more forest cover than we ever did in our history. Okay. And uh, also it was pointed out that even if all of Nepal was a canopy of trees and nobody lived there, the level of landslides in the Himalaya with the intensity of monsoons that we have is going to be the same, people or no people. Now, this went completely counter to the standard narrative of why we do develop in the Himalaya, afforestation, all kinds of forest uh, programs, and so on, okay? Now, this applies, the same thing applies to us uh, in water resources, in water and energy, where I work. What has been perplexing in the last 30 years of the fights that we have had with different development agencies, including the World Bank, is how these very venerable institutions can go so wrong. We have had projects where, you know, you would have thought if the World Bank was capable of anything, it was capable of doing good economics. But there it was pushing a project in Nepal that was five times the market rate, when the private sector was doing it five times cheaper. And the people pushing it were so certain that this was the best thing for Nepal since the invention of, the, uh, of fire and the wheel, uh, that for those of us opposed to it, it was quite an uphill battle. Okay. And uh, the same you know, to try to convince them that this, you know, you can't build a project that is five times more expensive than what the market is doing, you know. You would have thought it's so simple, and especially to the World Bank. But no, it was, it required a tremendous amount of agitation to finally to get the World Bank to pull out, okay. Now, the same story is repeating itself. Uh, we're currently in the Himalaya with springs drying out, okay, right across the Himalaya. Now, the immediate knee-jerk uh, supposition is climate change. Our research, when we actually went and started measuring what's, what is happening and trying to understand what was happening and why springs were drying, it's right across the Himalaya, from Indian Himalayas right through Nepal, right to Bhutan and so on, you know, Sikkim and all. We find out that, and don't get me wrong, temperatures are rising, there's no doubt about it, you know, and all the models we had, global mo models looking at uh, climate change in applied to Nepal, uh, the, the global circulation models show and do a pretty good job of predicting temperature rise. Whether you backcast them or go forward them, they do a good job. Temperature is rising. There's a bandwidth, but that's it. But when it comes to precipitation, you know, it's all over the chart. All these models show that precipitation in the Nepal Himalaya with temperature rising and climate change can be less by 53% or more by 135%. Now, if you're a politician, choose what you want. If somebody is raising too much noise about there being too much water, you say climate change is going to reduce it. If it's too little water right now and drought, you say, wait, you know, we're going to get 135% more water in the days ahead. That's how politics works. But we found out that this, the, it was the drying up of springs had nothing to do as yet with climate change. It was bad technology, over pumping, uh, the, strangely, the out migration of massive amount of men folk leading to a decline in livestock keeping, leading to a decline in buffalo wallowing ponds, leading to a lack of infiltration into the ground. I mean, you can go on with all these, you know, drivers, okay? But the knee-jerk supposition among all development agencies, if that's the case, it must be climate change. And to caricature, it's getting so, fa so bad 
that if a buffalo didn't give milk, it must be climate change. <laughs> now, this is where these things we end up, those of us who study this, end up with what we call contradictory certitudes. Different organizing styles are so certain that they are right uh, that they would refuse to believe what somebody else says. A government agency or a World Bank or whatever is so certain that you know, what they're doing is right that it takes a tremendous amount of activism, you know, social and environmental activism, to come out and say that you know, this is not how it is. Now, if saner heads, cooler heads prevail, then there is some kind of a constructive engagement and you come to a compromised middle, which is probably where the truth is. But generally, there is a barricading, uh, a circling of the uh, wagons, and filtering out. Now, this is what is really interesting. Uh, in institutions, what are their inbuilt institutional filters that takes in certain data as information, but filters out other data as noise? And I can give you hundreds of examples. We had a massive flood in uh, what we call a cloudburst in 1993, just south of Kathmandu. Destroyed 40% uh, of our electrical system, washed out I don't know how many bridges, highways, and so on. Uh, uh, because we had 540 millimeters of rain in about nine hours. Okay? And of course, that washes off everything. Now, there was a irrigation project which was still under construction, almost complete. And when it was designed, it was designed for 8,000 cubic meters per second flood. Okay? There was one measly data that showed that there might be 12,000, but it was rejected as a statistical outlier. Uh, partly because the Kuwaiti fund and the Saudi fund that gave the money didn't have more money. And if you take the bigger number, you've got to design bigger gates and bigger spillways and so on and so forth. And I said, yeah, 12,000, 8,000 is improbable enough. This 1993 cloudburst brought flood, not uh, 8,000, not 12,000, but exactly 16,000. And we had trees, the diameter of that window over there, stuck on gantries, you know, where it shouldn't be. Uh, many people died, six Chinese contractors died, and so on. Now, but here, there were no environmental activists who would have, once they found out that the 12,000 uh, data had been uh, re rejected as a, as a noise, you know, that that solidarity would have picked up that data as information and started a campaign. So the question is, you know, what kind of a social uh, milieu do we have? Is there one hege hegemonic voice or is there, are there multiple voices that do multiple types of filtering of information uh, or a single one and a single hegemony? This brings me to my closing point, uh, which uh, I'm now getting into philosophy to try to understand all this. The older we get, the more philosophical we get. And I am into, uh, uh, I've, I've had to lecture recently because I started a colloquium at the Nepal Academy on uh, what we call the colloquium on the philosophy of science and sociology of technology. It's a very relaxed thing. Uh, people ask me, well, how, how often do you do it? I say, whenever I feel like it, you know. Um, but we've done about four or five. The result of it was that our biggest university, Tribune University, has started uh, an obligatory course uh, where I just give lectures, I don't do correcting papers, uh, on the philosophy of science, that you have to take that course, all PhD students, you know. And while preparing and delivering those lectures this year, I got really intrigued by accident, by the questions that they asked, into two areas uh, of which I'll discuss one. One is feminist philosophy and science, and it seems to me, it's extremely important, I never thought of it, that you know, it, the, the, the method, the, the, the place from where they ask questions is so different, uh, and the way they define the problem is so different, that the solutions they're going to propose is going to be even more different. Now, this is one intriguing factor. But the other one, which I want to briefly touch on, and uh, I'll stop with that, is uh, a very ancient uh, uh, Hindu philosophy called Samkhya. Now, Samkhya predates the other five. Uh, there are six of these systems, Vedanta, you know, all sorts of things, Nyaya, and all that. Samkhya is one of the oldest ones. In fact, it predates Buddhism. Buddha was supposed to be a Samkhya Shraman before he became a Buddha. Okay? Now, this is very interesting. It's a very atheistic kind of a philosophy. But different from Western philosophy that sees subject-object division, what Samkhya does is it is more plural. Uh, it's not dual, but it's, well, what is the other word? Three, uh, trial, uh, I don't know, whatever you call it. And what it does is it assumes not just the subject and the object, it says there's the cognizer, okay? 
And then out there is the manifest and the unmanifest. Very clear distinction between these two. Okay? Now, the manifest is what we're seeing right now. But when you think of it, this was not manifest. It was unmanifest an hour ago you know, and will be unmanifest by 6 in the evening. Okay? And so on with everything. A seed sprouts into a tree. You know, it was unmanifest as a tree, and after the tree falls or burn, gets burned down or whatever, it's unmanifest again. Now, this is one kind of the, 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 the triad. What this gives rise to is three different things for me when I talk about or think about uncertainty. First, between the manifest and the unmanifest. You begin to wonder and you say, my God, I mean, yes, it's so uncertain. Evolution, it challenges some very deep fundamental ideas of evolutions to bring in surprises. It's not always that a seed will sprout into a tree. The seed may be eaten by a bird, uh, the plant may be nibbled by a rabbit, and that's the end of evolution as you know it, okay? But there are many other ways that, uh, you know, the, uh, the unmanifest does not really become manifest the way you are. So you're forced to ask, you know, what is that process, you know? And there's a huge amount of uncertainty there. The second is that uh, between the relation between the cognizer and the manifest, uh, Samke philosophy gets into nine moods that it generates, Navaras as they're called. Much of uh, music, uh, uh, Indian music is designed around that. But basically what this means is your actions are determined by your mood perception of between the cognizer and the manifest. You know, is the mood one of hatred, is one of love, is one of wonder, is one of, uh, you know, there's nine of these anyway. Now, so this means that a, a particular manifest might be inciting nine of these moods, inciting very different actions, leading to something very, very different outcome. And finally, the third one, which is between the cognizer and the unmanifest. How do we understand the unmanifest? There's a whole world of, of, of the unmanifest, and this challenges us with the, our understanding of the nature of causality. Okay? That, uh, you know, we say this is the cause, this is the relation, this is how it happens. But then we are forced to think and say, well, is it really that way? So I'll close with an apocryphal story about Einstein. Uh, some apocryphal. It said that Einstein was walking in a park with a blind friend. It was a very hot day, and he said, let's have a glass of cold milk. The blind friend said, I know what is cold, but what is milk? So Einstein said, it's a white liquid. So the friend said, I know what liquid is, but what's white? You know, it's blind after all. And, uh, well, Einstein said, well, white, white is the color of a swan's feather. The friend said, well, feather I know, but what's a swan? So he said, well, swan is a bird with a crooked neck. He says, well, I know what a neck is, but what's crooked? At which point Einstein's patience ran out. He grabbed his friend's hand and said, straight crooked, straight crooked. At which point the friend said, ah, now I know what milk is. <laughs> That's our understanding of uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Again, perfect, perfect set of provocations. I didn't. Einstein did get himself into some strange situations, didn't he? But uh, also for reminding us about how you look at it as intrinsic, as intrinsic as how it is when it comes to uncertainty, and and how in that regard the the, the politics of climate uncertainty is so different from the politics of the uncertainties of precaution that Silvio was talking about, where the politics is in many ways the opposite way around. So thank you very much for those further provocations. And Sheila, please, over to you. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Ian, and everybody else who's been involved in organizing this. Um, uh, Deepak, I'm, maybe that story should have been about Wittgenstein and not Einstein. Uh, but um, it's, uh, it feeds very nicely into the things that I want to say as well. Um, so I think that uh, with a little bit of uh, reflexivity, uh, the ways in which all of us think about uncertainty have something to do with our own experiences, and both of my distinguished colleagues have already spoken about the ways in which their prior work and, and thinking about these subjects led to the take on uncertainty that they have now. Uh, I am in the field of science and technology studies, but I came into it uh, not as a scientist, as Deepak introduced himself, uh, but as a lawyer. And um, in STS, those of you who are familiar with the field, you will know that me most people, many people, entered because they've been following the sciences or doing science at some point all of their lives. And for them, the question has been the one that um, 
uh, David Michaels was in a way worried about, which is the production of doubt. How is it that people disagree and uh, why do people pull facts apart? And you know, you see that reflected even in the name that we have given to our own particular weird age, post-truth, suggesting that we were in a state of truth before, and now we're in a state of post-ness uh, about that idyllic condition that we, we found ourselves in. For a lawyer, I think the picture looks very different because law is an adversarial field. And what you're trying to do is uh, not just build up your side's um, case as the one that will be plausible, but to some extent tearing down the other side's case uh, as not deserving of, of uh, respect or credibility. So from the point of view of a lawyer looking at uh, science, facts, certainty, uncertainty, whatever, the puzzle is not so much why do people disagree about facts, but why do people agree about anything? Uh, so it would be about the politics of certainty and not about the politics of uncertainty, in a sense. So the way I put it myself is uh, what gives things stickiness? Why, do, why does anything adhere, take hold, uh, and what do we have to say about that? And I think that uh, Ian began with uh, uh, sort of uh, situating us in the moment and why we should be thinking about these things, and it's well to remember that many of the things that we took as certain as recently as 1989 uh, now appear extremely much in doubt. I mean, so, you know, ever since the end of World War II, there was a sense that democracy was the wave of the world and it was the one that was going to take over all other forms of political life speaking of the politics of certainty and uncertainty, there was a sense that truth was going to prevail and the Enlightenment project was going to achieve some kind of, of um, nirvana-like terminus. And yet, if you look at the governments of uh, many of the countries that we come from, uh, the opposite seems to be true. I mean, so all of that sort of sense that, you know, you go back and read Kant's What is Enlightenment uh, essay and, you know, the sense that we would all become uh, sort of responsible believers in what science had shown us to be the state of the world, and then we would be able to exercise our own judgments and, and come to responsible decisions about ourselves and society. Well, very much the opposite seems to be what is going on. So what, why the unraveling, and was it the moment of certainty? How... How long was it anyway? It wasn't the interwar period, right? I mean, when was it? 1956? I mean, you know, the, the, we might want to sort of do a little bit of soul searching about that as well. Um, all right, so in STS, we've developed a lot of tools, uh, things like Harry Collins's famous work on experimenters' regress way back when in the 1980s, to look at the minutiae of how people take facts apart. I mean, what is it that makes people take those things apart? I think we've devoted less attention and interest uh, to how they put them together, and above all, to why they put them together in the first place. I mean, so this... Um, kind of play of of uh, the known and the unknown and you know the sort of dyadic thing you were describing uh, what are the contexts in which uh, uncertainty dies out and certainty prevails uh, some of you are probably familiar with the field of public policy and since it is dominated by another field called economics there is a great deal of certainty there um, policymakers seem to be very content to know exactly what should be done. Uh, recently, I had a colleague of mine who's uh, helping me teach a summer school that's forthcoming next month uh, say that, well, he was going to talk about nuclear energy. He didn't want to talk about nuclear waste because really we know very well what to do about nuclear waste. It's just a matter of you know, implementing the right solution. And I thought to myself about the politics of certainty. I mean, that is, you know. Uh, but, but the fact is that if you want to give credence to another person's position and accept that that rests on a set of commitments that people really truly believe in, then it's not enough for us to smile knowingly, you know, us in the 
the environmentalist community, broadly speaking, and sort of chuckle that anybody could think the nuclear waste problem has been solved. But rather to ask why is this very knowledgeable person, one of the people who knows the most about anything nuclear in the world, so convinced that this is a problem that has been solved. So again, what are the sources of certainty? Um, so I think one can, uh, since Andy wanted me to mention co-production, I will, uh, one can say that uh, there is a take on the world that says that knowledge, the way we know things about the world, and norms, the way in which we think that the world should hang together, the should, the is and the ought, that these are not separate. It is not the case that the is comes first and then people decide the ought, but that the is and the ought are mixed together in very complicated kinds of ways. Um, if that is the case, then we can take knowledge and we can take norms and ask the stickiness question about each of them. Uh, and then come to an answer, which will again, to some degree, loop me back into what Silvio and Deepak have already said. So if one looks at something like knowledge and just looks around one, reads the headlines, which coming from America, I now hesitate to do. But every day, two or three of the headlines dismiss things we all knew. I mean, so how does one do diplomacy? How does one bring a country like North Korea to heal? Uh, if you would read the newspaper headlines of the last week, you will know that it is by turning diplomacy into reality show. And maybe that works better, even though the diplomats are all crying, I mean, literally weeping, at this idea that all of the norms of diplomacy have been broken. Well, what do... I think, I mean, I think that there's normatively profound problems with the idea of embracing somebody who, you know, has credible accusations of murder and, you know, uh, genocide against his own people raised against him and that there's something problematic about democracy when we say that there's no difference between the one kind of regime and the other kind of regime. But that is not the same as believing in the expertise about diplomacy and what the right way to conduct diplomacy is. So you could go through uh, many of the destabilizing things that are happening right now, and I will spare you discussions of the British side of this, though maybe we will want to come back to it at some point. <laughs> well, I figured that, that you have had your fill, and more so. Uh, but the, it is a moment that invites us to ask, where does that certainty of knowledge come from? And sitting in academia, I think we are very much involved in producing those certainties, and we have to think about that. So when something like one of the biggest prize-giving organizations in Norway uh, bestows uh, its most prominent uh, Nobel-like prize on one of the makers of nudge theory, and at the same time, or you know, months before, uh, a similar organization in Sweden has bestowed a similar prize on the other chief organizer of nudge theory. One might ask, you know, where does the certainty about choice architecture come from? Uh, do these people really believe that the rationality towards which they are nudging other people does not itself rest on choice architectures? And whose job is it to investigate those choice architectures, the subliminal ones, the ones that have not been exposed, uh, rather than the other ones? So, you know, for STS scholars, you will understand that this is, it's convenient for us in academia to point the finger in deficit model mode at those other people who don't know as much as us, but the ways in which we know things is itself part of the undergirding of the production of certainty, and, and very much there is a politics of knowledge at play today, and we see it in the decimation of the humanities and the retreat of, we were talking a little bit earlier, of bookstores and libraries. I understand this August institution no longer has a library. I mean, so it is about the things we know and the things we don't know, and they're playing out on the ground in the politics of knowledge making. One can say similar things about norms, and one of the things I would like to throw out is that we know norms not because they're written down, but because they're violated. And one of the things we're seeing right now in the world at large 
is the extent to which we were dependent on norms. Civility is one that has been talked about. You will not find it in a constitutional order. You will not find it written down anywhere. You won't even necessarily find it in how you teach your kindergarten age kid to say thank you. But the norms of civility we see have broken down. And what is the relationship between civility and knowledge making and democracy and politics? I mean, those are the kinds of things we should think about. And, and I think that the world is showing us that it is far easier to break norms than to put them back together. So for instance, it was easy enough, remarkably easy, for a president of the United States to get away with not revealing his tax returns that was a tacit norm. It wasn't written down in law. But to create a legal engine that will force that person to release the tax records, records is a way more difficult proposition and way less certain than the certainty with which the norm of not disclosing the taxes was brought about. So, you know, I think that's that sort of dynamic is worth thinking about. So the last thing, institutions, which Deepak, you mentioned and Silvio, you obviously tacitly also mentioned, a place where things get sorted out, where we arrive at the balancing of knowledge and norms and end up saying what is certain or uncertain is institutions of different sorts. So each one of these has its own dynamics. You can think about law and law courts as being institutions that, that are in the business of uh, you know, producing certainties of different sorts, and I think um, you know, throughout the course of these days, uh, it'll be interesting for us to think about uh, which institutions we credit and which ones we defend uh, because of the point that Silvio made, what is a good good certainty and what is a good, un and what is a bad um, certainty or uncertainty as the case may be. So what is the role of powerful institutions in channeling uh, certainty and uncertainty, both of them towards the good as opposed to the bad, and then of course where do our standards for the good and the bad come from? So I'll stop with that. Uh, th thank you, Sheila, as well. Um, wonderful, and, and thank you all our panelists. That was I, I mentioned at the beginning how. Uh, rich and diverse the experiences and the topics are around the room and I think you've really done justice to that. We've had, we've had um, science, we've had discourse, we've had science and technology studies, different varieties, Kantian, Santia, um, uh, feminist philosophy, all kinds of different things woven into these really coherent questions around where does doubt come from? How is it made? How is, but how is certainty produced also? And how is the uh, social chicken and the material egg, how do they relate to each other in these reflexive, these reflexive ways? So I can't do, I can't, I won't attempt to summarize more than that. We're going to come back in two rounds of discussion. They will be questions, but there'll also be plenty of things people want to say in their own right to these themes. This is, whole session is by way of opening things up. We have two days to cogitate on what gets raised. So we're not going to try and sort it all out now. So we really encourage all colleagues here to just bring things in to the mix that we really need to deal with over these next two days. So thank you uh, for, for the really challenging uh, talks. We were about, already about to answer uh, the question uh, we <laughs> um, uh, in this small group. Sorry? Sure, sure. Um, my name is Detlef Müller-Mann, University of Bonn in Germany. So um, uh, we would like to come back to the question of norms and normativity of uncertainty. Uh, and um, to pick up Silvio's um, question, um, how to distinguish between good and bad uh, uncertainty, uh, we wonder whether this question is, is complete or whether you would rather have to add something. So whose uncertainty are you talk talking about? On which grounds do you decide, uh, on, on which norm normative background are you deciding and distinguishing between good and bad when it comes to uncertainty? Hi, Natalia Wzidowski, University of Hamburg in Germany. Um, 
our question that we had in our group relates very much to the first question. Um, not only how do you decide what is good or bad, but there must be differences of good or bad for whom, for which kind of actors. So that's also not a dichotomous um, uh, decision or a dichotomous problem. Thank you. Guy uh, Schlieber, University of Utrecht. Um, also, in, uh, following up on the previous comments, we were also wondering the, uh, when Esterbeck came up, the, the, t the different scales of knowledge we address and also what are our different ontological perspectives when we discuss uncertainty. Because as we discussed, uncertainty is also a very subjective concept. And so, almost like a preflection of the whole conference when we now discuss in different groups on different disciplines, what do we mean, mean by uncertainty? Do we have a common ground or will in the end our common kind of shared knowledge become a bit too mixed up to really come to a meaningful conclusion at the end of the conference? So I wonder how do we account for, for different ontologies and um, yeah, w when we discuss uncertainty as well as how does uncertainty relate to um, discourses of safety, security, um, and these issues, yeah. And part of that, of course, that gentleman in detail features why we've also got these clusters mm -hmm. and pursue these discussions in a more specific setting as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, great uh, question. Mm -hmm. um, at, at the back. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm Niels Houter, Swiss Re. Um, you mentioned uh, 1992 Rio as a moment where um, uh, uh, scientific facts from by some people and uncertainty by other people uh, create a sort of inaction on the political side. <clears throat> but Rio also uh, created a lot of action on the business side. That was uh, something that was actually in the program. Uh, Morris Strong, who you may know, actually promoted that at the time. So what I would like people to think about is how the same outset can create sort of uncertainty on the one side and certainty on a different side. Sorry, um, I'm Paddy van Swanenberg from Buenos Aires and Steps. And uh, for the moment, Paddy's Brian Wynn from the University of Lancaster. Uh, it was our group, but I don't want to discredit Paddy with what I'm about to say. We, we, um, we were uh, trying to work out how to pose the question as to why it is that authority which is often the concern that actors are, you know, uh, that's what they have as their objective when they're articulating certainty, uncertainty, building it, whatever they're trying to do. Um, so the question for us was about what, does authority require certainty? Um, as Sheila indicated, you know, the natural condition we ought to really suppose is actually uncertainty and it's certainty which is the question. In the same way that many anthropologists talked about, you know, con conflict might be considered the normal condition of humankind. And so consensus or apparent consensus is an achievement. And we could go into sociology of scientific knowledge there and say similar things about knowledge, but let's not go there for now. Um, so that's the issue that we're trying to put into the uh, arena here. Uh, Richard Bronk, London School of Economics. I, I thought it first might just be helpful to bring in George Shackle for a moment, um, who made the important point that Silvio started with, that uncertainty is the flip side of the freedom to imagine new options. It's the flip side of innovation, so it's not wholly a bad thing. And the other thing was to pick up this, the last point about the modernist emphasis on certainty. Um, and I think this has become a real problem in terms of judging the value of experts and of scientists. There is no binary distinction between being able to fully predict the future and having no clue about the future. And in fact, most of the time, scientists and economists and investors and so on are using models to try and diagnose emerging patterns, trying to make sense of 
uncertainty, trying to make sense of what is happening. And we're not trying to fabricate certainty. Thanks all. Very interesting uh, <laughs> uh, points you made. Uh, I'm uh, Petar Anklo from uh, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And uh, partly inspired by these talks and also the discussions, I've, I have been thinking about, the, at least for the politics of uncertainty, I think that the temporal dimension is something that we need to consider all the way. We had a discussion here where I kind of mentioned, okay, I've been studying uh, 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 emergency um, personnel, they live with uncertainty and have to kind of make decisions uh, kind of on, the, on the fly during uncertainty and then you have the other uh, people I've studied, policymakers that, are, uh, that have kind of the, the opportunity to study these problems in, in detail. And the kind of the issue on how much uncertainty that you can live with is also a matter of how much time you have. And for example for climate change uh, that will be more of a pressing issue every, every year. But I think that that's, that's something that we, when, when you talk about the politics of uncertainty, you can always kind of find, re, try to reduce uncertainty to an optimum, minimal uh, level if you have all the time that you want and if you don't want to do anything and don't want to make decisions. And that's a viable political strategy, as Silvia, Silvia mentioned. But uh, if you the kind of the issue of temporality, I think that is something that we need to consider for all these different fields that we're uh, discussing. Thank you. Um, Declan McLean, University of Sussex. I'm particularly interested in the definition of uncertainty and what definitions we're working on. Uh, for example, Knight looks at uncertainty and classifies it as risk. So do we understand uncertainty to be, to be actually uncertain or, for example, something that we can qualify or quantify in a particular way, which therefore defines it as risk? There's lots of uh, very interesting ideas. And I, we were just talking about how much energy there was while you all were talking. So I think that's just a foretaste of what's going to happen in the coming two days. I'll just pick up on a couple of uh, points that was raised. Uh, Many of those questions went back to this whole issue of ethics. And ethics, uh, as we understand it, uh, is all about action. You know, there's cognizing and all that, but ethics comes into play only when you have to act. And you act within the, the you know, how much uncertainty you can live with, uh, and at what point do you say, okay, fine, there's no way I have to act at this point. And, you know, the, this thing about absolute certainty versus is it certain enough, you know? That's where ethics comes in. And I think this is a field of study that was ignored for a long time and is now coming back with a vengeance uh, with all, all these issues. Uh, I want to highlight a, a couple of cases only. One, uh, you know, we were building a cable car a ropeway, a goods carrying ropeway in Nepal. And that's the most mountain friendly and climate friendly technology because it uses only half the energy for the same amount of the tonnage of goods as a road, uh, you know, with the diesel trucks, okay? The funny thing was, you know, this was a goods carrying ropeway and we had told people, uh, it was a five hour hike to the village if you walked, but this took only 15 minutes. So it was a great benefit for the villagers to take uh, goods up and down. But they were not meant to carry people. Uh, because people carrying ropeways needs a safety factor of about seven times more. Okay. Now, this was a very simple thing, just meant to carry sacks of rice and whatever, whatever they were going up and down. But people started going on it, and it was very difficult to stop them because, you know, would you, you know, just go up in 15 minutes or walk five hours? And the climb is vertical. And in Nepali, we have different words to express slope. And the kind of slope we have was uh, the one that your nose touches as you walk, you know, that's the kind of slope. So people were climbing on it, and there was a couple of tragedies, you know, people fell and all sorts of things. But uh, when we protested, we had a meeting in the village trying to say you shouldn't be doing this, shouldn't, again, ethics, you know. An old lady, you know, just got up and said, uh, you have seen what are called in Nepal girlings, you know. These are just, uh, they used to be of rope, you know, uh, uh, but now they're steel cables, and with a pulley, and just a rope, and people sit on them and you know, slide across the river. 
Very dangerous. Girls go to school every day that way. It's pretty dangerous, okay? Now, what this lady asked was, well, this ropeway that you have built, it was a Swiss Army goods carrying thing, second hand that we had brought over from Switzerland. Was that more safe or this girling more safe? If people can travel on a girling and everyday girls go to school hanging on that rope, you know, across a torrential river, you know, versus this one where you say people should not ride. Now, question comes, you know, who decides? You know, and, and what is the level of uncertainty we live with? So this is where action comes in. I want to just mention one more, which is, uh, I'm sure you're aware of uh, this book that came out 25 years ago, John Adams out of University College London, I think, 1995. It's just called Risk. And I don't know how he got away by writing a book with only the title Risk, because one would have thought, you know, 10,000 people have written on risks. OK. But this book is very interesting. It's got a black cover, Risk, John Adams in red, Risk in white. But the black cover is very interesting, because what he says is that entire black cover represents 5 million known chemical substances. And there's a small square, white square on the top, which is 7,000 chemicals out of those 5 million tested for carcinogenicity, okay? And out of those 7,000 tested, only 30 are definitely linked to cancer, which means that, you know, something like, you know, six one thousandth of a percent of the chemicals that might give us cancer, we have no idea of. But we live with that uncertainty pretty happily, you know? So it's not just plastics and McDonald's that we're worried, that which we are currently worried about, but there's this huge five million chemicals that might cause cancer, any of them, but they're not tested, we don't know, and we're quite happy about it. So it's the question of how much uncertainty we can live with and how much we are made to live with and we accept. I think that's where the issue is. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thanks, Deepak. Um, of course, since many of the questions were about power, whenever somebody says we, of course, one has to ask who is inside and who is outside the we-ness in question. And I think that when we're talking about certainty and uncertainty in a gathering like this, um, we have to put back in the question about the symmetries and asymmetries of who is going about generating the knowledge. Um, so uh, in Deepak's wonderful examples, I mean, the first one was about comparative risk. I mean, so two things seem to be of equal danger. Why are we questioning the one and not questioning the other? And that is what generations of risk assessment experts have made their livings on, pointing out the irrationality of taking numerically similar things, or even worse, you know, things that are statistically much, much safer, not questioning them, taking things that are statistically much more um, um, dangerous and living with them, like the girls going across the stream, but, but not the other thing. But, you know, as long as we're talking about ethics, we might ask an intervention that is not based on, you know, traditional forms of competence or whatever, but somebody decides to put this thing in. Um, did they do the study? I mean, if it is five hours versus 15 minutes, I mean, maybe somebody should have made the extra investment to make it for people as well as for goods. I mean, there's a choice being made about which things carriage up the mountain you're going to valorize more than which other thing. And human labor versus the safer transportation of the goods so that they don't get banged and you know destroyed on the way. I mean, it, some choices are being made there. And who is making those kinds of choices in order to build the technological interventions that we do build and not build the ones that we don't build? So sitting looking at many of these issues from a legal point of view over many years, of course I've been struck at the asymmetries of the things that people choose to question and not question. So in the early 1990s, industry, including preeminently the chemical industry, which you just named, raised a series of challenges in the American law courts about the standards of evidence that should apply. And the decisions that came out of that era said plainly and simply that the kind of science that the plaintiffs produce is typically junk science, bad science, et cetera, because it does not adhere uh, to scientific standards. Now, how could it adhere to scientific standards if nobody has bothered to question these things in the first place? I mean, so many of these class action cases were actually about intervening in women's bodies and women's reproductive processes at industrial scales, like breast implants, like 
contraceptive devices that had not been tested. But the fact is that the basic science, I mean, there is no basic science of these technologies anyway, and whose responsibility was it to conduct them? So if after the fact, going on outcomes, you're generating uh, the method, you know, post hoc, then it's not going to be as validated as classic Kuhnian science where you have the theory and the paradigm and so on and so forth. So maybe the right question should have been about why there are no normative standards within scientific practice for generating reliable science in certain kinds of cases and not in others. So the asbestos industry is a canonically great example of this. For 70 years, nobody bothered to aggregate the health statistics. And then when people started, when the workers started suing, of course you could have knocked them off the table by saying you're doing bad science because you know these are the first preliminary things and nobody knows what the right standards should be. But if on the other hand you ask the normative question of whose responsibility should a public health disaster be, given that the people in the best position to generate the knowledge in the first place did not do it in all of those decades when they should have been doing it, then it's a different question. And one of the things I find problematic is the extent to which Progressives and non-progressives alike tend to sidestep the normative questions. I mean, they ask the wrong question. Uh, I'll leave you with one little anecdote that comes out of my experience of today. The ex-governor of Michigan, who was, I think, a Dell executive, uh, and billed himself as, uh, you know, a, an apolitical technocrat, but happened to end up presiding over the Flint water crisis. Uh, he has been given some kind of invitation to the Kennedy School, and everybody in the Kennedy School is up in arms, and they're up in arms because generations of, or an entire generation of children in Flint have been poisoned by lead. Now, that to me is an example where the progressive point of view is hitting the wrong question. It is not obvious by what standards these children have been poisoned by lead. It is possible that, is it a generation? I mean, you know, one can do experiment as regress on the good position as well. On the other hand, there are about 19 different violations of what one might consider normal democracy, normal human rights, normal adherence to regulatory standards, et cetera, et cetera, which build up a far more powerful case about democracy having melted down than the one that is about, you know, exactly what damage has been inflicted on these poor children about which we're going to fight forever because, you know, I know the lead case is still fought over and, you know, 40, 50 years after the, the initial epidemiological evidence began to point a certain way. I think precaution under those circumstances is absolutely warranted, but it's warranted on political grounds. And if we fail to raise the political questions, it just speaks to the power of science to take normative questions and translate them back into epistemic uncertainty questions, when far better, I mean, there are questions of epistemic certainty and uncertainty for sure, but if we could link them back to the responsibility questions out of which they arose or failed to arise, I think we would make more powerful arguments about how the world should end up. Thank you so much. Yes, um, not too much to add there, but I'm, I'm happy that the first two questions and many of the other picked on my bad and good uncertainty and made you reflect about uncertainty for whom or whatever. I think those were the words that have been used. Uh, of course, uh, uh, my questions, uh, the three questions I asked, I will remind, uh, were related. The question is why at a certain point in time, certain process, uh, people decided that we're drafting what we called later the precautionary principle, decided not to associate the word uncertainty to science. The second relates to the, ide the idea that is the temporal, you know, if you had all the time in the world, the answer would be 42, which is the lack of full scientific certainty. It relates to ideas about the question about night and the distinction. Can we say that 
we no longer have that distinction between strict uncertainty and risk, or, or in Shackley, the ideas about innovation or novelty in George S. Corrigan and all the rest. So the point that I want to argue, and then I ended up with the good uncertainty and the bad uncertainty, which is clearly a, a provocation, and it worked, I'm happy about that, in the sense that, of course, I don't believe there is good uncertainty or bad uncertainty, but today we have people judging which kind of uncertainty can be detrimental, or when do we have to stop doubt if you look, for, ex for example, in, in extinction uh, rebellion, things is the time for doubt is finished, okay? And that has some normative uh, consequences. Are we going to say that people who talk about uncertainty in these circumstances related to a certain of systemic transformations are those to be judged? you know, as many people protest. Are we going to ban? We have seen lately, for example, uh, Mike Hume, who is a distinguished climate scientist and a good person, saying, I'm a denier. What I'm a denier about extinction hype, okay? And he was attacked and all the rest. So in those conditions, can we talk about uncertainty? So on which things are we there to talk about uncertainty and about which things we don't, okay? Now, I, I will finish soon because I had a third example which in a sense completes and relates to things that, uh, that Deepak and Sheila mentioned. Okay, uh, the third example I had, illustration about the epoch, is uh, you know, an article in Nature about uh, clean air. So around 2008 and so on, uh, the US EPA, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, decided to have an expert panel on clean air. Why we have an expert panel to, resol to resolve those questions relate to my question about, uh, about precisely why we need to justify action in the face of uncertainty. Those things are related. Now, what it came out that the expert panel said, and this is it, the quantitative evidence is characterized as, as having high uncertainties, okay? So, in a sense, is and uncertainty, so we leave the decision makers with the question. In a sense, we shift the problem. And what David Goldstone says in this article is say, what to do in the face of uncertainty is a policy political problem, it's not a scientific problem. As with the other things I said, I'm not taking side on these things. I'm just mentioning why when you have, you start by the situation where uncertainty is the thing that it should not be named. Then you come to the point where you start playing the uncertainty game, or the certainty game, as you wish. You know, when we started working on uncertainty, we were aware of, uh, and we discussed that with Mike Thompson's article on the Himalayas on contradictory certainties, right? which you mentioned. Uh, and then it comes to a point where, uh, you know, uh, we realize that the question is uncertainty for whom, but also uncertainty where. Okay, so I personally, coming from mathematics and science, I could say, for me, uncertainty was never a problem. You see? I could argue that the whole history of mathematics was taught in relation to certainty and not to uncertainty, but we can easily tell mathematics history in terms of uncertainty, which is not a big problem. But it arrives a point where I say, when is a problem? 
is a problem when it, we, we pack together what it is scientific uncertainty and when there is policy decision making and, and the question of norms and decisions and things like that. So the whole issue here is to just to reflect about these two are two different things, but they have been put together and the way they have been put together is not by chance but a result of a historical process that started uh, a long time ago. Thank you. Great, Silva, and I, I, I'm so excited by these strands. I just want to throw my own pebble in the pond before we go back again, which is this, and it riffs on your last point, Silvio, about the, the policy, when science in, engaging in policy, and the point about authority that came from Paddy Bryan at the back there. Um, there's a sense in which, as has been basically stated in different language, when we speak of uncertainty, especially in relation to politics and policy, we're actually using this sort of Cartesian modernity re uh, vocabularies to talk about something, be it's, it's not about the relation between, we are in fact talking about something else. And I was thinking about, you know, for instance, the work Collingridge, to put another name in the mix, did on justification, the way in which what we're really talking about, as our speakers have said, is, a, is the dynamics of blame, the dynamics of, of uh, legitimacy, uh, the dynamics of justifying policies. That, so when you put the, 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 the chicken of uh, accredited knowledge and the egg of social practice, and you ask which, which makes which, it really is questionable which way it goes in ways that our, each of our speakers have drawn out. So there, I think, the point about economics, which came in really nicely, because we've got this unusual collection of w threads here together, including economics and finance, that although there's a fault line often opens up between the interpretive and the calculative, Actually, I know of somebody who's often tried to engage and critically engage with economics. There is no point. We've heard about Knight, Keynes, Shackle, Lowesby, I'd add to that list as well, where economists have not themselves explored these issues, but then with the role of economics in that scar tissue of justification more than any other discipline, it then, it there, then it's this dissonance. Economics knows these issues better than anyone or as good as anyone else, but then when it comes to speak to policy, that doesn't get articulated. So I think that's somewhere near, somewhere near our uh, uh, surface as well. Um, I think what I'd like to do is actually go back, should we go back into a quick um, huddles? Um, so a quick whisper conversation, pick up things where we haven't addressed something properly, where something else needs to be surfaced, just like we did before, and then I'll get to wield the bell again uh, <laughs> after that. So please, go for it again. Come back for quick interventions from our panel, especially about things you think we should carry forward. Issues, challenges, provocations, so the onward discussions in the particular settings, where in the end, the only way you can really start making real sense of this is in particular contexts on the ground, which is where we're going to turn to in the, in the themes and the clusters. But, hey, panel, please, let us uh, hear what you think to wind us up. Um, thank you, Curtis, an incredibly thoughtful set of uh, interventions. And it would uh, be impossible to do justice to any of them. But um, since you asked about the regimes of truth, and you know, I guess my main worry these days is the extent to which uh, people forget the regime part of the regime of truth. I mean, that, that the factual knowledge that we claim, whether it's certainty or uncertainty, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, things that we claim to know or not know that these are profoundly embedded in all of the other kinds of things that are being said. I mean, the, the classic mystery story questions, you know, cool bono, I mean, you know, which the last speaker just raised. And that is, it is not neutral territory. And often what we should be querying is not the knowledge, which is the kind of presenting symptom of a deeper set of cultural uh, conditions, uh, out of which you know, even the choice to put it as a question of knowledge emerged when maybe something else should have been the, the driving issue. So, of course, most of us in this room, I will presume to speak for everybody, think that there is at least a matter of urgent concern around climate change, whether we go the extinction route or not, that this is something that we should be thinking about. But surely, side by side with that, we should think that during the entire emergence of this thing called the climate regime, 
uh, fundamental questions of whose responsibility it was and to what degree, and therefore what kinds of solutions should obtain or not obtain, that these got systematically read out of the picture. They got read out of the picture in part because people decided that forming the scientific consensus was the first step to take in a linear uh, array of steps and not uh, a more complex, more recursive set of understandings about how knowledge and responses and actions should relate to each other. So this relates a little bit to the Oxfam puzzle, because of course we are always forced to make decisions uh, without knowing what all the consequences will be, but we rely on certain kinds of things, so, you know, incrementalism, feedback, recursion, I mean, these, these sorts of things, and it's, you know, it could be that it's irresponsible to put in place a multi-million dollar investment decision without looking at what the returning signals will be and over, over what set of time and, and so on and so forth. Like, like it would be irresponsible to put a child into some kind of experimental school system without you know, getting some sort of signals back about whether it is working for that child or not. Um, I mentioned the Flint, Michigan, story and you know with that so while we've been sitting here I mean so keep in mind that the Kennedy School invites hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people including some people who were really by my standards pretty stunning to come you know I mean like after the twenty sixteen election we invited did you say the, I did say stunning yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the idea is that there is a supra-arching norm that powerful positions in society deserve to be debated and heard so that people can go away. I mean, you know, Harvard on the whole is an engine for turning out liberals. And how does that happen? I mean, you know, so one has to be committed to something. I mean, and it doesn't happen by cutting off debate even at the at the beginning. So the Flint Michigan thing, I mean, it's not, Rick Snyder is not the worst person we've ever invited, you know, to our heads in the years that I've been at Harvard, okay? But here's what the, the dean writes. And the people of Flint, Michigan, and especially low-income black residents, have suffered acutely because of their poisonous water supply, and I have been deeply moved by the personal and thoughtful messages I have received from people in Flint. I believe the Kennedy School needs to study both failures and successes of government, and we anticipated that students would have learned from engaging with and questioning Governor Snyder about his consequential role in decisions regarding Flint and many other issues during his eight years in office. We appreciate Governor Snyder's interest in participating in such discussions in our community, but we and he now believe that having him on campus would not enhance education here in the ways we intended. And so Dunman Stadler will not be coming to Harvard. Well, we can have different opinions about this, but we can also ask, you know, where how moral certainty and uncertainty are playing out vis-a-vis -vis epistemic certainty and uncertainty. And Silvio introduced the word complexity. I do believe we live in a complex world. And I do not wish to see the current president of the United States elected. And I fear that a decision like this, made by my triple alma mater and my employer for the last 21 years, is not necessarily calculated to achieving that greater good of bringing into the fold the people who will vote their knee-jerk anti-liberal credentials, partly because of decisions like this. Thank you. Thanks for drilling down post Putin remark into liberalism there. Sylvia. Yeah. Uh, today uh, I managed to talk first in the first uh, round because it, when I speak after uh, she like really don't have anything to say. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, I, I think that I want to thank you all for the questions. Sincerely, I put I made a tweet in about the interesting audience. I, I said interesting audience. I didn't say interested audience. <laughs> uh, and it's true, and of course it's not surprising that interesting uh, people will ask interesting questions. 
And there are many things I would like to talk, uh, raised by several of you, the relation between, uh, you know, uh, I have it here, trust, <coughs> protection, risk, and danger, and what are the consequences. But those who have been in the, in, in the business of risk for a long time, uh, you know, we have this Custom things have now seen already. But I want to pick on, on uh, one thing on, on Sheila's uh, idea of complexity now. And what are the consequences of us? You know, we can do a lot of metaphysics and ontology and other things on, on complexity. I won't do that. Sorry. Uh, but the point is uh, uh, and has to do with mistakes. I think, like Stephen told me, that uh, the age of, uh, of blueprints is finished, of the future. And I'm going to be very careful when I say a word, which is experiment, because it's a loaded word. But uh, if the age of blueprints of the future is finished, we are going to have to experiment. And if we with all the, you know, caution in using that word. And if we are going to experiment, we are going to err. And if we are going to err in a situation where people are not used to, because of our history, uh, our own civilization's idea, that, uh, you know, you, you, you quantify, you, you find it towards the truth, Therefore, you can predict, and then you can manage, and then you can manage. If that situation is broken, then we are going to err, and we are going to make mistakes. And therefore, how do we change this, I would say, awful paradox, let me call it that way, between credibility and legitimacy? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as I say, uh, thank you very much for your questions, and I hope in the next couple of days we can address them uh, as they decide. Thank you, Sylvia. I'll over to Deepak. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's such a rich set of ideas bubbling around. Uh, I think we're going to have two very interesting days. But let me just pick up on a couple of things that uh, really struck me at this point which is, you know, how are uncertainties produced and also being part of this political you know, fashion party, uh, I would say that, you know, much of politics is really about, well, not just handling uncertainty, but creating uncertainty, at least of the other guys. Okay? And uh, I, I find this one, the whole idea of production of anxiety, production of trust and distrust and these are the core political issues around uncertainty. Let me take them to two things uh, that we're going to be probably discussing in the days ahead. The first is climate change. Uh, when we in the global south, and my perspective comes from the global south where I live and work, uh, on climate change, you know, what is really interesting to us right now is here is a problem created by the energy sector where society is being impacted through the water sector. You know, whether it is more floods and droughts, or whether it is uh, the humidity moving up and malaria vectors moving up because of the humidity, you know, it's a water sector that's where climate change impact is being felt in society. Now, when you look at this, and you look at the Global South in many areas, uh, many countries, uh, when you look at policies of government, uh, I've always said that, uh, and we looked at it in detail in the park, for instance, government policies and climate change are so good. I've always said Nepal deserves a Nobel Prize if there ever is one, okay? But if you look at the implementation, my carbon <coughs> footprint as a Nepali, in a country that has got one of the best hydropower resources, my carbon footprint in the last few years you know, has more than quadrupled. So what good is a government policy that's so good on climate change? You read it and it couldn't be better. But then the real practice is something else. And you try to reverse that, try to talk about you know, reducing carbon footprint, and you will be marginalized in 10 seconds flat out of all politics. Because most political parties get their funding from 
the truck owners, from the, uh, uh, you know, we call them bulldozer owners, those are politics, and a whole lot of other people, the importers of uh, petroleum products. There's a huge amount of money involved. So they literally have politicians in local elections we recently had. Half of all the local government officials elected recently are members of the contractor association. <coughs> and most of them have their own bulldozers and you know, bulldozers. So that's how our footprint is increasing, despite the fact that uh, we have some of the best policies that on Copenhagen or uh, Poland or wherever these climate conferences go, ministers can say with a straight face, well, this is our policy. But the action is completely different. So this is where that uncertainty thing comes in. The other one, the last one I talk about, is the failure of development. You know, and this is another big Global South issue. And I think this is particularly pertinent to talk here because IDS uh, has got D in the middle as development. And I think the time has come to come back to it. And why I say this is because, take Nepal, we are smack in between India and China. And what we are now facing is this whole BRI, the Chinese uh, you know, investment, and so on. <clears throat> it's not just Nepal, but the global south. Uh, I have a son sitting in Uganda and, uh, as a lawyer and the finance ministry he looks at their Chinese contracts and he has some pretty hilarious stories to tell. But one of them is very interesting. You know, this whole thing about the Chinese debt trap that's being talked about in the press. The average African leader's reaction is this. He like, you know what we're doing. You know, we're getting this money for infrastructure and we think, you know, we are sure it is good. That's the reaction. Debt trap? They say, yeah, the only debt trap we know is when we did know about this, and it's called colonialism. <laughs> and that's the end of the, the, end of the debate. You know? So we are now faced with the failure of Britain Woods institutions, the rise of other alternative mechanisms coming around, and uh, the question is, you know, where does development go from here? Uh, what kind of development is development? What is mad development? What is app development? You know, all these things are coming into this uncertainty mix right now, and it is often a life and death issue, you know, in the global south. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll just throw one pebble in at this, a further one that struck me from this. Again, thank you so much to the panel for that wonderful summing up. That it picks up on this point about, about equality, about these power dynamics and how these relate. Migrants, sedentary, north, south, humanities, natural science, uh, incumbents, subaltern. These have come up in various vocabularies repeatedly. And if we're really interested in the quality of knowledge, the qualities of uncertainty that Silvio began us with, and take seriously Sheila's point about the co-production of social and epistemic orders, then as a hypothesis, we're not short of simple, overly simplistic platitudes in this field, but here's one I just would really appreciate people thinking about. Maybe the, most, the highest quality knowledge, the highest quality uncertainty is realized when the relations are most equal, whatever those salient relations might be. Democracy has been mentioned, liberalism, Sheila mentioned civility, equality. Maybe there's something which it only will have meaning in different settings of practice that we might uh, interrogate and, and, and feed into the discussions. But what I want to do now is thank everyone. I want to thank the panel for a really wonderful uh,